Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the latest edition of Wow Lynch Wow. Dedicated to filmmaker David Lynch and inspired by the triumphant return of Twin Peaks. A friendly warning to everyone who isn't caught up on all 18 episodes of the new Twin Peaks. There will be spoilers and they will begin shortly, so viewers and listeners be warned. Part 17 begins with Gordon Cole making a confession to Albert. 25 years ago, Major Briggs told Cole and Cooper about an evil entity he discovered. In olden times, this negative entity was called Jow Day, later to become known as Judy. The trio established a plan that could lead them to Judy, but then something happened to Major Briggs, and something happened to Cooper. Also, a long time ago, Philip Jeffrey said he was on to this entity, and he disappeared too. Cooper had told Cole, if he ever disappeared, to find him, that he was looking to kill two birds with one stone. We also learn Ray was a paid informant who indicated that the Cooper they met in prison was searching for the coordinates of Major Briggs. Cole had no idea if their plan was working, and Cole is sorry for hiding this all from Albert. Headley calls Cole with a pretty worthless update, and Battling Bud delivers the message to Cole from Cooper. Cooper's headed to the Twin Peaks Sheriff Station, and Cole is finally on to the fact that Dougie is Cooper. Chad appears to be up to no good in his jail cell. Bad Coop is driving down a road. The eyeless woman begins making animal noises. James and Freddy are mesmerized. Chad is perturbed. And the drunken parrot again joins the chorus. Ben receives a call from Wyoming police. They found poor Jerry naked in the woods, and Jerry thought he electrocuted someone with his bad binoculars. Ben's going to arrange to get Jerry a ride home. Ed Coop is heading to the spot near Jack Rabbit's palace, the spot where they found the eyeless woman. The vortex opens, and Bad Coop vanishes. Holy shit! He's in a cage at the fire station, with the giant floating head of Major Briggs. The fireman is floating around on his back, and we see an image of the Palmer house. Then the cage floats into a golden device and spits it out to the Twin Peaks Sheriff Station. Holy shit! Bad Coop's at the Sheriff Station, and he's merrily greeted by a smiling Andy. The eyeless woman isn't happy about Bad Coop's presence. Freddy and Jimmy are baffled, and Chad grabs a key hidden in his Leo-style boots. Lucy and Andy are absolutely delighted that Bad Coop visited. Bad Coop meets Frank Truman for the first time, and Andy couldn't be happier, but then he remembers his vision. Chad escapes, and he sneaks off to open up a locker. Andy is extremely happy, and he grabs Bad Coop a seat. Bad Coop declines a cup of coffee, and Andy runs off to go tell Hawk the news. Chad loads up a gun. Andy tells Lucy, very important, very important. Chad pulls a gun on Andy. Andy seems doomed, but Hulk and Freddy saves the day. Lucy looks surprised by a call she receives, and she patches it through to Frank. It's Agent Cooper. He learns that Frank is Harry's brother, and Coop asks if they have the coffee ready. At that moment, Bad Coop and Frank pull their guns on one another, but Lucy saves the day. The real McCoy hears news of this and warns them to stay away from the body. Andy brings the jail crew upstairs. Lucy finally figured out cellular phones. Hawk busts in. James comforts Naido. And everyone is mesmerized as the woodsmen appear and begin doing their thing. Cooper and the Mitchum brothers are on the scene. The woodsmen are doing their thing. And here he is, Bob, in orb form. He's floating around and he looks angry. He knocks Coop on his ass. Coop asks for Freddy. His destiny is here. Bob and Freddy have a back and forth battle. Bob jumped out to an early lead and Freddy's Hulk hand bailed him out. 
After several swings in momentum, Freddy delivered the knockout blow that shattered the Bob Orb. Pieces were flying everywhere, and they vanished as they headed upward. You did it, Freddy. Cooper places the ring on his doppelganger's finger, and Bad Coop vanishes as the ring crashes to the floor in the Black Lodge. Coop asks Frank for the room key for number 315 at the Great Northern. Bobby joins the room. Coop tells Bobby of his father's genius and foresight. And Cole, Albert, and Tammy bust in like a bunch of Johnny-come-latelys. Cooper tells the room, some things will change. The past dictates the future. Candy, Sandy, and Mandy arrive with a large abundance of sandwiches. Coop and the eyeless woman touch hands. And the eyeless woman is revealed to be Diane. Holy shit, she has red hair now. Cooper gives Diane a kiss in a room full of onlookers, and Cooper asks if she remembers everything, and she says that she does. The clock is turning to 2.53. Cooper says, We live inside a dream, and I hope I see all of you again, every one of you. Then Cooper seems to have temporarily entered the moment from when Jeffries appeared but didn't appear. Cooper, Diane, and Cole are walking. They arrive at a door, and Coop unlocks it with his great northern key. He bids them farewell, opens the door, and says, See you at the curtain call. Coop is greeted by Mike, and Mike recites his favorite poem, Fire, Walk With Me. Coop and Mike are walking in the convenience store. They're moving slowly, and they're awfully quiet, and the running man heads in the opposite direction. Mike opens the door, and the two of them visit Philip Jeffries. Cooper says, February 23rd, 1989. Jeffries replies, I'll find it for you. It's slippery in here. It's good to see you again, Cooper. Say hello to Gordon if you see him. He'll remember the unofficial version. This is where you'll find Judy. Jeffries shows Cooper some familiar symbols that wind up as a number eight. Jeffries tells Cooper he can go in now and remember. Mike says electricity. Holy shit! It's a jump back in time to Laura's final hours. She hops on the bike with James. Cooper is watching from a distance. Laura screams when she sees Cooper. Coop tries to hide, and James and Laura resume their dialogue from her final day. She jumps off his bike at Sparkwood in 21. She tells James she loves him, and then she runs off into the woods. Leo, Ronette, and Jacques are waiting. But Cooper intercepts Laura. She recognizes him from her dream. Cooper reaches for Laura's hand. Before Pete Martell goes out fishing the next morning, Laura's body is no longer there. Cooper leads Laura home by the hand. And holy shit, Pete is fishing. There's no Laura, no dead body. So Pete actually gets to do what he wanted to do. Pete is fishing. But things are not well in the Palmer house. Sarah is making some awfully spooky noises, and then she grabs Laura's picture, and she begins smashing it with a bottle over and over and over. Cooper is guiding Laura by the hand, but then suddenly Laura disappears, and we hear the sounds of her demise from back inside the Black Lodge, from right after she whispered to Cooper. Part 17 ends with Julie Cruz performing at the Roadhouse, and Part 18 begins with Bad Coop burning. He seems to be suffering, but he doesn't appear to have been destroyed. Mike puts the Dougie seed next to the lock of Cooper's hair. He says the word electricity, and the gold pearl creates a new Dougie, and he's fired up to know where he is. Dougie comes home, and Janie E. and Sonny Jim are thrilled. Cooper's leading Laura through the woods, and she vanishes from his grasp. Cooper remembers back into the future. Mike beckons Cooper. He follows. It's the arm. The arm says, Is it the story of the little girl who lived down the lane? Cooper remembers Laura whispering to him, and her being subsequently destroyed. He also remembers Leland saying, find Laura. Cooper exits a curtain, and he arrives at the sycamore trees. Redhead Diane is there. 
They greet awkwardly. Cooper and Diane are driving down a road. They travel almost exactly 430 miles in some direction from somewhere. There's a strong electrical presence. Coop checks his watch. Coop tells Diane to kiss him. He says once we cross, it could all be different. The two kiss passionately, and then they're ready. They get transported somewhere else and are now driving down a dark road. They ultimately arrive at some sleazy motel. Cooper goes to check in, and Diane waits. She glances over and sees another version of herself just standing there. But this doesn't seem to concern Diane. Cooper and redhead Diane do what couples normally do when seeking out the shelter of a sleazy motel. And they don't waste any time getting right down to it. Cooper wakes up, and Diane is nowhere in sight. There's a note there, for Richard, signed from Linda. Holy shit, Richard and Linda. Cooper exits what appears to be a completely different motel. He drives away, winds up arriving in Odessa, and he stops at Judy's coffee shop. Cooper asks if there's another waitress that works there. It's her day off. Some scumbag cowboys begin harassing the waitress and Cooper tells them to leave her alone. One of the scumbags pulls a gun on Coop, but that was a huge mistake. Cooper quickly has the situation in order. Cooper asks the waitress for the other waitress's address. She writes it down for him, and Cooper drops the scumbag's guns into a deep fryer. Cooper leaves, and the scumbags are awfully confused. Cooper pulls up to the address written down for him by the other waitress, and he sees the number six telephone pole. Cooper knocks on the door. A woman answers. Cooper thinks it's Laura Palmer, but she says her name is Carrie Page. She didn't seem surprised that the FBI stopped by, and she's in some kind of trouble. Cooper thinks she's Laura Palmer, and he wants to take her to her old home. Carrie agrees to go with him. She's in trouble, and she thinks she'll be safer with the FBI. She goes to grab her things, and Cooper notices a dead man on the couch with a hole in his head. So Cooper and Carrie make the long drive to Twin Peaks. At one point, Carrie becomes paranoid that they're being followed, but the person instead passes them without incident. They fuel up, and they continue on their journey. When they arrive in Twin Peaks, Cooper asks Carrie if she recognizes anything but Carrie remains unmoved and says no. They reach the Palmer house, and still, nothing. Cooper leads Carrie to the front door, and they knock. A woman answers the door. Cooper introduces himself as FBI Special Agent Dale Cooper, and he asks for Sarah Palmer. The woman says there's no Sarah Palmer there. They bought the house from Mrs. Chelfont, and the woman Cooper's speaking to is named Alice Tremont. Chelfont and Tremont? Holy shit! Cooper apologizes and him and Carrie leave. Suddenly, Coop and Carrie look back at the house. Cooper asks, what year is this? The voice of Sarah Palmer can be heard from inside the house, and suddenly, Carrie begins screaming and the lights inside the house turn off. Then we see Laura whispering to Agent Cooper from the Black Lodge. And so ends Twin Peaks The Return. Where to even begin here? The initial takeaways for me from the two-part finale. Number one, Gordon Cole hinted that he still has some sort of connection with Philip Jeffries, who doesn't exist anymore, at least not in a normal sense. When Cooper told Jeffries a specific date, Jeffries seemed able to access relevant information from that day. He seems to also recall being asked about this recently. The important thing here, I think, is that Jeffries mentions that Gordon Cole will remember the unofficial version of events. This suggests Jeffries is aware that Cole has access to this real memory. Cole admitted he dreamt about it. Jeffries was never there that day, but he was there. But I think what Jeffries meant on a deeper level is that things are continuing to be altered in a not-what-they-seem sort of way, and that Cole will remain in tune with other unofficial versions of a growing number of other changing situations. 
Number two, what was the plan of Major Briggs, Gordon Cole, and Agent Cooper? I'm assuming the evil entity Briggs discovered was the mother of all evil, Zhao Day, known now as Judy. They had some plan to track her down that involves time travel. We know this because very early on, the concept of Major Briggs the Time Traveler was introduced. Garland's dead body was that of a man in his late 40s, and his fingerprints were getting hits all over the place during the last 25 years. I don't know exactly what their plan was, and even Gordon is clueless as to how the plan is unfolding. But you can bet that there's a lot more to this story than what Cole revealed. Number three... Cooper's considerable skills and intuition outwardly played little to no role in the destruction of Bob or his doppelganger. All Cooper really did was show up with the ring that Mike gave him. Coop basically reminded Freddy that he has a destiny to fulfill, and then Coop watched on as Freddy did all the heavy lifting. And Lucy had already gunned bad Coop dead, so all Cooper had to do was place the ring on his doppelganger's finger. Number four, Cooper says we live inside a dream, and I hope I see all of you again, every one of you. There are a million ways to interpret this particular part and everything that follows, but for me, I think this is a big giveaway that David Lynch and Mark Frost do indeed have aspirations to continue on with the story. Number five. Cooper was trying to change Laura's fate yet again. First, he did so by telling her not to put the ring on and fire walk with me. That's something that has always baffled many a diehard fan. And then Cooper did it again here by intercepting Laura from her final fate. But once again, Cooper failed in his efforts to save Laura from her fate. And Laura vanishing from Cooper's grasp this time, in the past seems to have been directly connected to whatever it was Laura whispered to Cooper in the Black Lodge approximately 25 years in the future. So we have a bit of a loop going on here where the past and the future are still clearly being affected by one another. Laura leaving Cooper's grasp seems like a decision Laura made in the future from the Black Lodge. This kind of ties into the way that Annie warned Laura to write the diary entries, which, as we know, there's still one page missing. Of course Lynch and Frost want to ideally continue this story. Number six, Diane and Cooper entering that zone where everything could be different. Was this part of the plan devised by Briggs, Cole, and Cooper? Two birds, one stone? And if so... Exactly where did they go and exactly what changed? The language Diane Linda used in her note to Richard Cooper was similar to the language that Tulpa Diane used when describing Bad Coop after the prison visit. Cooper seemed baffled by this. It seems he didn't fully understand what the giant meant by Richard and Linda. He remembered the 430 miles driving in some unknown direction from some unknown starting point, but he seemed absolutely baffled being addressed as Richard. Number seven, while Cooper didn't outwardly use his considerable skills and intuition when it came to destroying Bob and sending his doppelganger back, he did utilize these assets when it came to tracking down Laura Palmer, or in this case, Carrie Page. Doesn't she look an awful lot like Laura Palmer? Cooper seems to think so, and Laura hearing Sarah's voice and screaming confirms this. But what year is it? The names Tremont and Chalfont are familiar names, but beyond time travel, you also get the impression that there are alternate timelines at play. Number eight. It now appears as if the firemen did not create Laura in response to Bob, because Bob was destroyed seemingly without Laura's involvement. So the Laura orb seems to have actually been created in response to the mother herself, Judy. And this is consistent with the theme that Cooper's main mission wasn't stopping Bob or his doppelganger. Cooper's main mission was finding Laura, a mission he's still pursuing. Cooper's mission is Laura, and Laura's mission is with Judy. 
In the grand scheme of things, Bob and the doppelganger may have been small potatoes. Number nine, while we don't know the exact fate of Audrey, I'm now inclined to believe that everything we've seen with her relates to this idea that timelines and events are being altered, and that the version of Audrey we saw is the byproduct of meddling affairs surrounding Laura Palmer's fate, something Cooper continues trying to alter for reasons unknown to us. And finally, number 10, Laura whispering to Cooper. I personally love that everything ended on this. The first time Laura whispered to Cooper, she told him that her father killed her. That was the big answer to the mystery that started it all. Who killed Laura Palmer? It was the one riddle Lynch and Frost never wanted to reveal. So here we are, 25 years later. This time we don't even know what the mystery is at the beginning. But the big mystery once again boils down to Laura whispering to Cooper. And now that the return is over, that mystery is even more mysterious than ever before. And I genuinely believe that Lynch and Frost have more of the story they would like to share with us, especially with the chilling cliffhanger ending we received. Who killed Laura Palmer has become What Did Laura Whisper? And How's Annie has become what year is this? In conclusion, for me, the Twin Peaks experience was always more about the journey than the destination. The growing sense of overlapping mysteries and a desire to learn more about this strange and wonderful world, I, for one, have absolutely loved the experience. And I'm grateful the Twin Peaks ever came back because honestly, I still can't believe it actually did. And Lynch and Frost continue to tell the story in such a way that my desire to explore this magical world further and deeper, that desire is now greater than it ever has been at any point in time, and I never thought that was possible. Twin Peaks The Return was a triumphant masterpiece, and no matter what happens, it was an absolute pleasure to watch. But I remain optimistic that we will get more Twin Peaks in the future, and I'm just itching to see it, and there's a whole lot of scratching in my future. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Please share your thoughts in the comments section, and have a wonderful night.